Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with another um, History Time video. Uh, this time, the real Ragnar Lothbrok Vikings documentary. As you guys know, uh, he's a little bit before my, my time period that I study. I am a late 9th century Anglo-Saxon England. So not really, don't really deal too much with Ragnar Lothbrok. And then when I wrote my thesis in the books I used, the for my research, there is not really any mention of Ragnar as a real person. So, um, but those books were a bit older. Anyways, um, let's go ahead and just dive right through Iceland. It would be recorded because of Christianity in its current state by one generation of poets after another, becoming one of the most popular and long lasting of all. The story is still being retold today. The saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. But is there Sagen um Ragnar Lothbrok och hans sonne? Is there any truth to the tale? I butchered. I butchered that. Let's find out. Now, I, I want to add here about the whole... Um, oral tradition um it's from my understanding when they decided to finally write things down it is complicated as to whether or not these are the true 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 uh, old norse beliefs because of the introduction and the permeation i guess would be a good word for it of of christianity and christian culture and christian beliefs throughout uh nordic uh life and culture by the 1200s um so a lot of the thing it, it's arguments can be made in saying that these are that you could argue that these sagas on especially on um the you know sagas of loki tyr frey of of the norse gods is possibly not a hundred percent right to what they were uh, is not truly correct and has been shifted a little bit to showcase a more heading towards christianity if that makes sense and then if you guys want to go watch uh i think this has been mentioned in like a video on the poetic edda was that what was it uh, with one of my overly sarcastic productions, Miscellaneous Myths videos that I react to, they read there, kind of talked about that as well with Christianity and whatnot. I thought it should be In the year 814, the great on. king Charlemagne, ruler of the largest empire in Western Europe since the fall of Rome, was dead. In the wake of his death, his once prosperous realm soon devolved into civil war between his descendants. In some of the other states that filled the void left by the Romans, such as in Visigothic Spain and Ostrogothic Italy, the Roman tradition of giving hereditary inheritance to one son had become the norm. This wasn't to be the case for the Franks. They continued their ancient tradition of dividing up an inheritance between sons a tradition that had plagued them for centuries. When the dust from the succession finally settled, all of Charlemagne's hard work had been undone, largely through the actions of his own descendants. Three distinct kingdoms were born. On the one side was East Francia, the state which would eventually go on to become Germany. In the middle was Lotharingia, a realm which would eventually be absorbed by the other two kingdoms. In the west, however, in the original heartlands of the Franks, along the Atlantic coast and the hinterlands of Gaul, was West Francia, the kingdom that would eventually become France. It was here, under the rule of Louis the Pious and his descendant, Charles the Bald, that a new distinct lack of centralised power would increasingly be capitalized upon by a new power. UK. 
Okay. For years, the Franks had pushed ever onwards to the pagan north to conquer new lands and bring more people into the Christian fold. And now, a reckoning was on the way. At first, they came in trickles, just handfuls of boats trying their luck. But as the years dragged on, ever larger waves of piratical sea raiders came flooding down from the unforgiving north. Yes. A okay. Viking age had begun. I kind of want to hear how he's going to talk about Frankish sources of the, the time deal. mention oh, Horik, the king of the Danes, likely just one Danish king amongst many, being undermined by the West Frankish king Louis the Pious, who had supported a rival claimant to Horik's throne, Harold Clack, in a struggle to overthrow him. Whilst this policy of divide and rule might have worked under the strong hand of Charlemagne, whose elite army might have made light work of the piratical newcomers from the north. Standards had slipped over the years, and the Frankish army was now a mere shadow of its former self. Yeah, I will agree. That typically is also what happens with uh, empires. You know, you have this one really amazing dude that fucking kicks ass, and then after his death, they kind of go downhill. After Horik successfully fought off the attacks from his rival, the full ferocity of the Northmen was about to come crashing down catastrophically upon Louis's head. First in the form of small fleets, and later in the form of a powerful and influential warlord who would smash his way onto the scene over the coming years. If the legends and stories later told about his life even bear any resemblance to the truth, then he was one of the first examples of a sea king during the Viking Age, and certainly one of the most memorable. Ragnar Lothbrok had arrived. Since the end of the Saxon Wars of the late 8th century, Scandinavian raids had been conducted into Francia. Those wars had been a long and drawn out conflict. Okay, and then I just also want to. I'm trying to take in the information here. Uh, so that's why I'm not talking as much. But here, uh, for those that may be curious about Saxon and then Anglo Saxon, like what's the difference? Or if there is any difference? There really isn't a difference. <laughs> Especially at this time, there's not much of a difference. The reason that the Saxons that leave, live on uh, England are called Anglo Saxons is purely a continental thing it was purely when the saxons that live on england they pretty much referred to them as themselves as west saxons up until really um the into the 10th really until like 10th century is when it kind of shifted uh ninth century you could argue late you know around when alfred became recognized as king of the anglo-saxons instead of just king of the west saxons that was that was a big thing. That was actually pretty important in his rule. Um, but originally, the reason that the Saxons of England were called Anglo-Saxons was just purely to differentiate them from the Saxons of Germany. So you would say you're talking to someone, and you're like, I don't know, they're, they're like, I'm a Saxon. They that that would then tell them that hey, this person. Is from Saxony. He's a Saxon. He's a German Saxon. Whereas, you know, if you told someone you're an Anglo-Saxon, that immediately tells them, "Oh, you're you're a Saxon on England or whatever." I think that was the best way to explain it. Probably not. Conflict <laughs> against the inhabitants of Old Saxony, the still pagan land immediately to the south of Denmark, and they had ended in the forced conversion or death of much of its inhabitants. Yes. Did do that. It was after this 30 year long evangelizing crusade that the Franks had first come into direct contact with the inhabitants of Denmark. Though the reputation of the Franks had almost certainly preceded them. As long as the Emperor lived, Europe remained largely safe. According to Charlemagne's biographer Einhard, writing just a handful of years later, the only places looted and sacked during his lifetime were certain islands off the coast of Frisia, 
near to the German coast. He even set up squadrons of coast guard to defend the river systems. After his death, all this was to change. With no, no strong-handed, powerful ruler to lead it, Charlemagne's empire quickly unraveled, and within just a few years, Danes moved in like carrion to pick at the corpse. And then also, yes, the Vikings at this time were not conquerors, they were just raiders. Um, and yeah, they were opp Vikings were extremely opportunistic. They did not really, they did not go for pitched battles. Around the time when they actually started going for pitched battles was in England, when they brought in the Great Heathen Army, and even then, um, they typically did actions that, avo that avoided pitched battles. Um, so... They, they were raiders at this time. Um, Squadrons of three or four opportunistic ships became common throughout the 810s and 820s, and they met with significant success by raiding remote and lightly populated areas on the peripheries of the West Frankish coastline. Yes. Under, yes. By the 830s, however, these fleets began to consist of tens of vessels, and as words travelled of the successes they found, they increasingly tested their luck. Okay, and then I want to talk about that tens of vessels thing. It may not sound like a lot, and it certainly is not a lot by if you if you actually hear about the numbers, because if it's tens of ships, that's probably still less than three hundred Vikings in total. In tens of ships. I think if I'm remember it's been a while since I've looked at the numbers. Um I used to know this number because, you know, wrote my thesis on it a little bit. It was, I had to know it for my thesis, you know. I don't know how to say words. <laughs> but, yeah, they were not massive armies. Like, even the Great Heathen Army, I think, I think it was, it's possible that that army was maybe barely over a thousand, if that when it invaded England. Like, yeah, they, at this time, there were not large armies. There were the uh, battles back in, specifically in this time, in, in this, I guess, you know, typical Dark Ages. You know, that, that's a term getting kind of thrown out now. Uh, the Viking Age time period, etc. Um, battles were very, like, it was maybe a few hundred people versus a few hundred people. Or like big battles. Um, so yeah. Against larger and larger targets. They now, of course, if that tens of ships, it could it could range up to maybe five hundred people, but I think it was most likely probably around three hundred. That's the number that sounds the most right in my head, off the top of my Dax, head. the silver minting center of Dorostad in eight. Sadly, I no longer have the, the book that I got those numbers from with me. I had to return it to my school's library. I finished my thesis. 834, 835, 836, and plundered the trading town of Valcaran in 837. On the face of it, King Horik seems to have disapproved of these raids, which he publicly condemned in letters to Charlemagne's successor, Louis the Pious. Though this could easily have been a ruse, it does suggest that in reality, King Horik held little power over the increasingly unruly and ambitious warlords of Denmark. In 844. Okay, so this is something that. So when it comes to Vikings, they did not really work for a king. They were independent of themselves. Um, perhaps at the beginning of the Viking Age, maybe they were under, like, if you're talking like 793 really early on they were probably pretty like under the control of their monarch where they came from of the lord of the land that they came from right however i think definitely by this time they've become more independent and really a viking so the viking sea captain uh if we just want to use that term like who ragnar would be um or just a viking leader viking leader of a ship typically Right? Just typically, generally, a Viking leader was 
a nobleman who no who gave up his claim to the thr the parts of the land um because you know this is this was also a way for the Norsemen and Danes to deal with um you know succession rights uh a way of and not divide the land um because you know it, it would be spread equally amongst the sons of the father, and so what the father, what what some of them would do sometimes is instead of further dividing the land that their family owns, the younger sons or whatever would they could go and take up the Viking life. Most of the time, it seems, is that they would give up their right to land. So that they could then become a Viking and then go in either uh, 865, it would turn to where they gave up land so that they could go and try and conquer land elsewhere, or they would just be joining a Viking crew to uh, gain riches, right? They would go to just raid and get money that way instead of owning actual property land, or, you know, they come back with wealth and they can just buy out someone and buy land up. <clears throat> so, and then. Viking leader would typically be those noblemen that were in line for inheritance, were probably the second or third, or like third sons or something, and they're like, "Hey, I don't want to divide our father's land up or whatever. Here, you can take the land. Boom, baba booey. <laughs> I'll be a Viking crew leader. It would it would be Scandinavian noblemen that would be the leaders of Viking crews, and then the people that made up the Viking crews." would be farmers. They would be the sons of, typically the sons of farmers, and they would give up their inheritance rights to their father's land, to their farm land or whatever, you know, if, if they're coming from that, to join a Viking crew to go get wealth. I think I find that okay. Right, not? A little rusty. Five, an entirely new breed of army arrived on the continent. Not just... But also, yes, when hearing who may really made up the Vikings crew that really also helps get that understand why they were very opportunistic and not actually pitched fighters tens of vessels but a fleet of hundreds crammed full with as many as 5,000 Viking warriors where this fleet came from is anyone's guess but according to the Frankish sources it was led by a man named Regan Harris, a figure who a number of modern scholars associate with the most famous Viking of all. And then, yes, of course, you would get these situations where, you know, you have a large, like, large army of Vikings coming in. Hence here, you know, so significant that it's getting mentioned, obviously, in the Frankish sources. Ragnar Lothbrok. <laughs> Semi-legendary. You can't see it. A number of sagas relate the tales of Ragnar's early life, yet the vast majority of these are likely to be later additions, added in as the tale of his legends and deeds became- Okay, I like that they're adding that distinction, like, hey, this stuff is possibly not true because it was possibly added on later. Inflated so I, over I like time, that they're adding that. especially as a large number of later warlords claimed descent from him and would have wanted to inflate their own egos, much like he himself apparently claimed to have been a direct descendant of Odin. As did yes. most Danish kings and warlords at the time, including his overlord, Horik. From 12th century runic inscriptions on the Orkneys to the Icelandic sagas of the 13th century, Ragnar became nothing short of a celebrity in the centuries after his death. Truth be told, if anything of his unusually flamboyant nature as related in the sagas has any basis in reality, Ragnar himself would probably be quite amused by these later stories that grew up around him. Nevertheless, whether he wore magical hairy trousers or not, hmm. the Ragnar that landed on the Frankish coastline in 845 commanded a huge force of warriors. 
over 5,000 Vikings if the Frankish sources are to be believed, all crammed aboard around 120 longships. Let me think of that number. Yeah, no, I think that would be that'd be roughly correct. Um, 20 longship. Hmm. Uh, that number might be slightly inflated for only 120 longships. 5,000. I don't. I don't. That number might be slightly inflated. Um. I don't think I don't it's hard to say because I I, I don't want to say it's wrong because I am rusty on what I what I am remembering uh, made up like how many Viking how many Norsemen could fit on a Viking long on a typical long ship but, I mean if you packed them tightly maybe you could fit that many I, I still want to say I, th I want to lean towards that number is slightly inflated. Now, of course, they could still have maybe probably over 3,000. I, I would believe that. Um, but I don't know if I could believe 5,000. 5, sounds slightly inflated on the Frankish side. Whether they had been sent directly by Horik or not, the Danish king was about to have his spectacular revenge against the Franks. Because remember, these long ships aren't huge ships, right? They're pretty small vessels. Now, of course, you know, you, you see one up close, it looks a lot bigger than what, you know, the drawings make them out to be. It can certainly fit a good number of people on those ships. Still, they're not... Can't hold that many people. Certainly one of the most colourful members of Horik's court, Ragnar's surname allegedly stemmed from the cowhide trousers that he wore into battle. I love this story. Which, if the stories are to be believed, he claimed offered him magical protection against enemies. According to the Old Norse sagas, which are quasi-historical at very best, and pure- I love this, I love this video. They're, they're like, taking like, hey, these are the written sources we have of Ragnar Lothbrok. This is, according to the written sources, this is what we know, and this is in a little slight slit uh tidbits of hey this is kind of what historians today are kind of feeling on Ragnar Lothbrok a little bit um and then you know this quasi historic oh, I love I love this they they are addressing the uh quality of the sources that they have I love it pure myth a lot of the time especially during this early period he made these magical trousers by boiling cowhide in pitch and subsequently used them to win his second wife, Aslaug, by defeating a serpent that guarded her. Precisely because he was one of the earliest sea kings to ravage Europe, if Ragnar Lothbrok was indeed a real historical character, and scholars today still rigorously debate the issue, his genuine historical accomplishments have been obscured over time. Yes. Over the centuries, stories were told to fill in the gaps of his life and genuine events were embellished so much that his tale became largely a fantasy. Nonetheless, if he was indeed a real historical character, and several Frankish sources seem to imply that he was, Ragnar was no mere pirate like those who came before him. He was one of the very first instances of a sea king, a seaborne ruler powerful enough in his own right to launch his own autonomous attacks and seize lands for himself and his followers on foreign shores. Reginerus, or Ragnar, had probably been active in Francia since the 830s, and by 841, he was granted land in Frisia by King Charles the Bald, probably as a bulwark against other Viking raiders. Yes. After a few years, however, he lost these lands, as well as his favor with the king. In 845, he entered the River Seine at the head of a huge host, the largest to hit Francia yet. In a time when armies usually numbered hundreds of men, according to the as I mentioned earlier, Frankish yes. sources, yes, Ragnar's force, history time, 5, doing so fucking good. Oh, this is me. They sacked Rouen, 
and made off with huge amounts of wealth before heading further south towards the capital, where they systematically plundered the fertile districts around Paris. Like his predecessors and his descendants after him, Ragnar only fought when the odds were with him and tended to favour yes. blitzkrieg tactics to terrorise, demoralise and overwhelm opponents before they could muster a strong enough force to oppose him. Determined to not allow the invaders to sack the royal abbey of Saint Denis, Charles assembled his army into two parts, one of which he placed on either side of the river. A shrewd tactician, Ragnar simply attacked the smaller army, wiping it yep. out in full view of their helpless comrades on the other side. And then, oh, wait, no, this Frankish is warriors could do nothing but else. watch, as just over a hundred survivors were sacrificed to Odin on a small island in the River Seine. Faced with insurmountable odds, the horrified defenders of the city could do little but wait for the eventual Viking attack. At the time, Paris was situated on an island in the River Seine. It was fortified with strong defences. Though isolated as it was, it was perfectly suited for a Viking blockade and attack. On March 29th, Easter Sunday, almost certainly a date picked on purpose in order to demoralise the already yep. terrified locals, Ragnar's men arrived and plundered the outskirts of the city. Before long, however, disease began to run rife throughout Ragnar's camp, which significantly weakened his position. Terms were eventually offered, and Charles begrudgingly consented to paying around £6,000 of gold and silver to get Ragnar and his men to leave. And they would call this um, payment um, just the Danegeld, or the Weyrgeld. Uh, this was the very first of at least 13 payments of Danegeld, paid over the centuries. And, and he says that he says it too. Yeah, nice. Free to come to get Viking raiders he says he's to leave thing. Francia peacefully. Whilst Charles was heavily criticized for this payment, he had bigger fish to fry. He would be criticized, yeah, probably his contemporaries criticized him for it. But over time, a lot of kings would do this. This would become Specifically, the Franks, this would kind of become the way that they would deal with the Vikings, is they would just pay them up until eventually the uh, Franks developed a, a system along their rivers where they had fortification, fortified bridges, which essentially kind of nullified the ability of the Vikings, and the Vikings would switch their attention really from Francia to England. Um, and of course, the series of fortified bridges that the Franks had would inspire would be partially would help partially inspire Alfred to build his system of um, fortified towns, burrs in England in well in Wessex and Mercia uh, when he was dealing with his Viking invasion. His brothers, disgruntled nobles, and regional revolts all threatened to stamp out his position at any time. He preferred. But yeah, as I was saying, the typical way of dealing with the vikings for i think a lot of the viking age was pretty much just pay them off it wasn't really until i can i kind of consider really so the 840s here 830s 840s 850s you could say that's like the peak of viking the viking age really for the vikings um i mean you could also say like oh they really peaked in eight like post 865 pre-878 you know 865 to 878 is kind of also could be seen as the because that's when they were carving out england for themselves um but then also post 878 is really where i would mark like all right the viking age is starting to really die off here vikings are no longer really all that effective in doing what they want to get done you know conquering and raiding and whatnot because europeans they've western europe has adapted and now the Vikings can't really get what they want done. Instead, to try to get the Vikings, arguably the least of his concerns at the time, to leave peacefully, if at all possible. Yes. Ragnar agreed to withdraw from Paris, though he seems to have pillaged several sites along the coast on his way home, presumably to Denmark. Upon his arrival, he 
he allegedly showed the wealth he had acquired to King Horik, and boasted about how easy the attack had been, though he also related that the only resistance they had met was by the long deceased Saint Germain of Paris, who he believed had sent the plague that had tore through his camp. Shortly after Ragnar's return, however, the King of East Francia, Louis the German, had apparently forced his overlordship over the Danes. Probably only some of the southerners, though this prompted Horik to execute many of the men who had been responsible for the Paris raid, and to seize back their plunder to return to the Franks. Mm. Along with a whole host of other reasons, namely economic and societal, this cracking down on raiders could be one reason why so many Scandinavians left Denmark at this point to arrive in other Viking settlements across the North Sea, such as in Ireland and the Scottish Isles. Hey, okay, yeah, yeah, that, that definitely could be argued. And I could definitely see that too. Ragnar, meanwhile, had apparently already left by this point, embarking on a piratical career that remains impossible to detangle from the mists of legend. Yeah. He may have gone raiding into the Irish Sea, back to Francia, or, most famously of all, he may have raided into Northumbria, though the king he supposedly fought against, Ayla, wouldn't become king there until the mid-860s. In 854, Horik was killed by one of his nephews, and the exiles from the Paris raid apparently were allowed to return home. Though Regenherus, or Ragnar, is never heard from again in the Frankish sources. Stories abounded to his eventual demise. Some say he was killed during a botched attack on the Isle of Anglesey. Others, that he died in a civil war between Danes and Norsemen off the coast of Ireland. Most famous of all- Hold on, I, I just want to mention- I love that distinction. Distinction of Danes and Norsemen. Yes, because it is they are referenced as being separate. Why the Danes and the Norse are different? I don't know. As as someone living in the modern day, with the Scandinavian countries being so really culturally closely related, but the the sources of back then and even written sources by modern day historians they reference and they say they specifically mention all right raiders from the danes or then they also say raiders norsemen raiders right there's a they they make the distinction of danish and norse right so and then the norse would be mainly norwegians and sweet norwegians and swedes um i think mainly norwegians uh, not probably not so much swedes um if we just go off of geographical geographical closeness with like you know Norway to England and whatnot and then Danes were Danes <laughs> however is the tale that he was shipwrecked off the English coast in a storm and captured yep, by the Northumbrian the king Ayla who in a cruel punishment against the old sea king had him thrown into a pit of snakes according to one telling of the tale his famous trousers protected him to the very end the disgruntled English king having to pull his foe out of the pit to have them removed before throwing him back in. Viking raiders again returned to Paris in the 880s, this time led by another of the most famous Vikings in history, a sea king named Rollo. Yep. In reality, no relation to Ragnar. In one of the great turning points in the history of France, and potentially one of the largest sieges of the Viking Age. A huge force of many hundreds of ships was finally repelled in 886. By this time, much of Britain had already fell under the sway of the Vikings, this time, according to the legends, under a brood of brothers, who, according to a number of traditions, called themselves the Sons, Sons of Ragnar. Ragnar. According to the tale of Ragnar Lodbrok, written down sometime in the 13th century, but told in mead halls from Dublin to Kiev for centuries before, Ragnar had several sons, all legendary sea kings in their own right. 
According to the saga, as he was dying in Ella's snake pit, Ragnar made a famous reference to these sons. Father is our biggest, most grand. Oh, yeah, we're fucking. When they hear of the old balls of it. Back when Vikings was good. Oh, how that show fell. Fuck. Ah, oh, it makes me so upset because this was like when the show was at its peak, I feel. Of course, it was never historically accurate. Like, I don't. I didn't watch it for the historical accuracy. I watched it because fucking Travis Fimmel was an amazing Ragnar Lothbrok. And the show was actually well written in the beginning. What I don't, I don't. Yeah. Oh, this just makes me so upset just thinking about how bad the show got. I'm Agent Mobius, by the way. These sons of Ragnar were indeed illustrious figures. Ivar the Boneless, perhaps the king of Dublin for a time, and progenitor of the famed Uyamer dynasty that would terrorise the Irish Sea for centuries to come. Bjorn Ironside, raider of the Mediterranean, later said to have retired to Sweden. Ubba, the Duke of the Frisians, and participant in the invasion of Britain in the 860s. Halfdan Ragnarsson, one of the first kings of Viking-occupied Northumbria, and Sigurd, snake in the eye, born from a sorceress. All famed warriors in their own right, though in all likelihood, not in fact descended from Ragnar. In the sagas, upon hearing of their father's death, Ivar and Ubba both swore to cross the sea to avenge him. Halfdan was playing chess, and when told the news, he gripped a piece so hard that his nails bled. The impending invasion is known to us today as the Great Heathen Army. Yes. Yes. The legend of the Krakomal, probably design. composed in the Scottish Isles in the 12th yes. century, epitomises the legend that Ragnar became when it records his last words, sung aloud as the snakes of Ella's pit circled in. It gladdens oh, me to know that Baldur's father makes ready the benches for a banquet. Soon we shall be drinking ale from curved horns. The champion who comes into Odin's dwelling, Valhalla, does not lament his death. I shall not enter his hall with words of fear upon my lips. The Aesir will welcome me. Death comes without lamenting. Eager am I to depart. The Disir summon me home. Those whom Odin sends for me, Valkyries from the halls of the Lord of Hosts. Gladly shall I drink ale in the high seat with Aesir. The days of my life are ended. I laugh as I die. Oh. Oh, that was amazing. That was... Ooh. One of probably one of the better fucking uh, videos we've watched on this channel. I'm just gonna say, it. this was great. I think this was a great. Uh, yeah, I have I have no complaints here. Um, and so I'm just gonna end it here. Yeah, I said what I needed to say throughout the video. Um, I think they covered exactly what they needed to cover. So yeah, that was the real Ragnar Lothbrok Vikings documentary by History Time. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.